So today we will ask, what is the business impact of design? How do we measure it? How do we change the mindset of an organization towards user centricity? Not an easy task, you're probably thinking, right? So, well, we have some people here that can help you with that. So first of all, can I ask uh, you guys to introduce yourselves and tell us briefly a little bit about you, your background, and what do you do at your current company? I'm gonna start with Fabricia. Fabricia, please tell us what do you do and what is your, what is your role and, and into it, please. So um, at McKinsey, uh, <laughs> sorry, Patrice, Fabricio, sorry. Uh, so uh, my name is Fabricio, I'm an associate partner at McKinsey. Uh, I've been leading design in the region. Um, and uh, design and customer experience, there's a lot of overlap and uh, I think this is an interesting uh, part of the discussion as well. Uh, what, what are the outcomes, what, what is the space that designers can, can uh, occupy in organizations? Um, so I've been working with design for over 20 years now. Um, I, I lived in different countries. Um, lived in Europe, the US, Germany, UK. Uh, I worked at IDEO for many years um, in the US and Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, now I'm helping companies um, in their challenges. Uh, they're not necessarily directly design challenges, but all of them are design challenges at the end of the day, right? If you're transforming uh, digitally, if you're building a new business, uh, if you're defining a strategy, uh, these are all places uh, where design leaders can, can have a role. Um, so that's the work that we do uh, with our clients. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Fabricio. All right, Patricia from Hi. Intuit. Hi, thank you very much, Bernardo. Great to see you. I love the community vibe that you gave, I'm just calling people by name. So I'm Patricia or Pat, whatever you prefer. I'm currently the uh, International Design Ops uh, Lead at Intuit. And I'm managing the operation for seven globally distributed teams, which are in Mexico, Brazil, Canada, UK, France, uh, India, and I forget, Australia. Did I mention Australia? Uh, so the task is uh, fun and exciting because, as you can imagine, it's seven very different markets, both from a uh, technology maturity level. Uh, the market, the designer's culture, it's quite different, but we are unified by customer obsession. So uh, definitely the topic of how you can push customer obsession, it's something that it's very, very close to what I've been doing in the past two years. Previously, I uh, worked mostly as a research lead and director. I set up research practices uh, for global companies like, like Vipro in the past, uh, for the Vipro digital branch. Uh, totally customer obsessed, I'm passionate about how we can put the customer at the heart of what we do and how we can make our designers more efficient and happier because efficiency brings happiness. And that's kind of my take on design ops. Amazing. Thank you very much, Patricia Pat. And last but not least, Jose from JP Morgan. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jose Coronado. I'm uh, currently leading the uh, global design operations team for um, a corporate and investment bank. Our design team is um, about 150 uh, people uh, across six different uh, offices. And um, we have basically a cross-functional team from uh, product design, research, uh, content, uh, creative technology, um, service design, and uh, design operations. Um, my background is uh, primarily in enterprise technology. So this is my first endeavor in financial services. And I come from a design leadership background where basically I have, um, in a very similar manner to Patricia, I have established um, a global uh, and run global teams um, a heavily distributed. Uh, so while the pandemic has uh, put that to the extreme, 
um, we, we are distributed in, in nature, whether we're in the same building, in the same neighborhood, in the same city, or, you know, 5,000 miles around the world in a different time zone altogether. And um, as many other people, uh, we, we have um, a struggle or, or dealt with how do we uh, measure the impact of the work we do and how do we position ourselves to align with the strategic value that the organization is trying to achieve? Uh, so very excited to talk about those topics today. Amazing, thank you so much, Jose. All right, so let's dive right in, folks. First question, how do we measure impact in a manner that is clearly articulated to our team and the leadership? Who would like to start? I'll, I'll, I'll get us started. Um, I think um, uh, looking back 10 years ago, uh, one of the exercises that I used to do with my team uh, was showcase what are the strategic priorities of the organization. In that particular um, situation, we have five. And I started every um, global meeting for my team with those five strategic priorities. And that immediately pivot to our team priorities and discuss how they align to the organization. Uh, so even if you were a designer just working in this single product domain, you see how your single product domain aligned with our design priorities and those priorities align with the impact of the strategic organization. And that was uh, a repeated repeated many times message so people would understand and internalize how their work impacted the organization. And that was um, something that I have continued to do uh, basically across uh, the organization that I have worked with. Fantastic. And that's certainly let, something- I'll let the ladies go ahead, go ahead Patricia, then I'll do. Oh, thank you Patricia. So yeah, there's a strong relationship between the business value and the, the value that design brings because we influence, uh, design can have a very strong influence on the business outcomes. And we, we can talk about different types of values, the value of design with a business lens. So what is the return on investment? How much design and designers can bring to the table and improve the user experience so that by making happy customers, we have happy stakeholders but also the value in terms of benefits and in terms of how much design is able to bring and voice the customer through the organization. Because I think that the biggest impact uh, that I've seen and I try to, to push and, and we kind of pursue it into it, it's design, it's one of those functions that bring the voice of the customers, it's constantly exercising empathy and amplifying empathy and that's again part of the value and the impact that design brings and it's uh, it's not always about dollars sometimes it's about the emotional cognitive experience and the value of the experiences that design delivers yeah and if i can complement uh what he said i think there's a couple of different discussions that i can we can break it down right um, I think there, there's, b before going into the impact itself, I think there's an interesting discussion of, are designers um, empowered to, um, to, to, to talk about impact and to have a role on, on impact, right, in your organizations? Um, we, we did a, a, a meeting, um, you know, a few months ago with some design leaders globally, and, um, and one of the quotes that came out of that discussion was, was remarkable <laughs> as part of that discussion is um, some design leader was you know, going into a board meeting and, and talking about impact and then people were surprised, like why are you talking, this is not your thing, you're the creative person here, like you shouldn't be talking about impact. So I think there's something about the role that it's, um, that what is expected from designers, right? And the role that we can take to, to discuss impact. I think there's, an, there's another point, there's probably like three or four things just to, to start with, I mean, this is a big topic. <laughs> The, the second one is that um, we, the, the, if we read the phrase and if we listen to the, the question, right, how do we measure impact? 
I mean, this is not a question that we were talking like among designers, like, you know, 10 years ago, maybe. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll bet maybe 10 years ago. I mean, it's a very new discussion. And by being a new discussion to think and calculate impact sometimes, like financially, of the work and the and efficiency, right? Uh, on design ops, for example, and things like that. I, I mean, this was not part of design at all, right? As in the discipline. So I think there's there's something to say about are designers ready to to calculate impact, right? And and to think about it. Um, and then and then there's another thing which is um, what to measure, right? And what is impact? Which I think uh, Patricia mentioned uh, quite well, which is. Is it financial? Is it social? Is it environmental? Is it about the culture, right? The, the impact that you're going to measure? Because all of these are going to be different metrics, right? Um, because it's easy, uh, and, and I wear the hat of the consultant, right? I mean, it's easy to say, you know, there's a framework and, and you, know, you can divide. There's like three ways of defining impact. You have operational, you have business unit, and you have the overall organization. That would be a way to separate. Uh, and then in each one of the, these buckets, you can put specific metrics, right? You, you can put metrics for um, just, uh, you know, daily active users, monthly active users of some digital product. You can measure sales, right? Uh, or you can measure revenues, right? Uh, but then we forget of all the other types of impact, right? Culturally, for example, like when you bring designers to an organization, you have a lot of cultural impact of that you know, profile and that type of, of, of professional. So I think this is for me just the tipping, the, 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 you know, the, the, the point of the, the tipping of the iceberg of this discussion to start yeah. with. And if I can add, I love the point you make on how the design industry has been maturing over the past decade and even faster in the past 24, 12 months. Because yes, uh, in old organization at the beginning of my career, and 20 years ago, designers were the ones that were beautifying whatever great ideas marketeers or salespeople were having. So they didn't have a say in, in the process. They didn't have a role about making pixels and images pretty. Uh, and now the strategic role, the impact that design is having, uh, it's growing to the point that actually we are having an impact. We are not just an execution branch of organization. I mean, I'm, I, I'm part of design, so I use the we because everyone that is in the problem solving and uh, absolutely we are in a phenomenally exciting time because a lot is happening and the impact we are having, it's, it's dramatically growing with clear, hard KPIs around efficiency, spending, operational, as you were saying. So... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And com uh, continuing from that, Patricia, I would like to ask you, uh, how does the business impact compares with the operational impact? And uh, how does that relate with design ops? Well, design ops, it's about uh, making business decisions that improve the impact and the influence of, of design. So it's kind of bringing together those two souls in a way because uh, design ops is not about designing pixels, it's about designing processes, it's about understanding the uh, business uh, environment, the customer environment, the designer's environment, and try to identify what is the end-to-end -end process and outcome that we want. So what are the input metrics and the output metrics and goals that we want to achieve? and uh, being uh, mindful of the context that we live in. So it's, it's all about understanding your context, understanding your ways of working and identifying. I mean, I'm, I spend a lot of time kind of working on the metrics and you have always three metrics. I mean, I've tried different models, but if you look, you will always have impact uh, that actually translates in business impact that can be derived through uh, time savings, mm, faster delivery can mean that you get to the market faster, but also faster delivery means less intera interaction because the quality is higher. So quality of product is higher. Or the third one, quality impact resources. 
uh, so which are, are your people. So if you keep this business project management lens and you combine what the business wants, generally more money, more customers, uh, how you can deliver that faster, better, smarter, that's exactly where design ops comes into play uh, and combines trying to make happy the business, make happy the designers and the design leaders you work with. Fantastic. All right, moving um, along then. Yep, I, go I, want, ahead, to, please. I want to add um, to, to what Patricia was saying. I think um, uh, uh, taking a, a, a quote almost from Dave Malouf's definition of, of design operations, um, where design ops basically amplifies the impact of, of design. Um, uh, one of the, the key aspects is that we basically have the responsibility of helping uh, design leaders uh, run design as a business, uh, not as a, a uh, not as a production factory. Um, so we have to help uh, shift the perception that design is is just the production of somebody else's vision, uh, but that we are actually the enablers of uh, facilitating the creation of that vision. Uh, we have to have uh, people that uh, with different levels of expertise from the uh, producers, you know, the people that are going to be on the, on the uh, enabler front, uh, but also people that are going to work at the strategy and vision level um, and, uh, and have that uh, relationship uh, with, uh, with the business leaders of the organization. And some of the things that we're doing right now, for example, deal with um, how do we manage the investment process? Uh, what type of uh, resources do we need to define so we uh, actually make projects actually happen? Um, what is the investment in design in comparison to technology? So all the things that uh, historically we have steer away from because somebody else was doing that for us or somebody else was defining that for us. And now we are the ones who are defining that for the organization. And that's, uh, I think, uh, a big aspect of uh, how, I, how we can uh, make that uh, a reality in the organizations that we're involved with. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I, I love this idea, uh, Jose, that you bring from, um, you know, leading and, uh, and managing uh, a business not in production shop. Um, it's, um, it's interesting to see how um, obviously design grew as it keeps growing, right? And in importance and, uh, and, and you notice that companies have that uh, transition into, oh, I'm interested in having this, uh, this capability um, into hiring a lot of designers and not knowing, you know, how to make that work, right? Uh, and a lot of designers getting in a happy, but at the same time, a lot of inefficiencies um, and that, I think, opens up um, an interesting discussion on um, the, the design organization, right? Like, what is, what is the setup, right? What, is the, what are the archetypes of design organizations out there, right? Um, there's very little understanding. There's very little literature and, and discussion on, um, you know, if you, if you take another, um, you know, similar field, right, that's, that's you know, deals with, consumers and, and deals with experience, like customer experience. Um, there is like predefined roles, there's different types of leadership, there are different, different archetypes of organizations. Um, so I think there, there's, there's a maturity, I think, in uh, bringing to design, in understanding that, you know, maybe you're gonna have a hub and spoke design organization, maybe you're gonna have a distributed one, maybe you're gonna have a center of excellence. Um, these are the, the, the different um, career journeys that designers can have in these organizations. I read the other day someone, I think, you know, we read so many things, like, you know, in so many platforms. I remember seeing um, a post somewhere um, about uh, some, some data about designers um, unhappy and leaving organizations because they don't let them grow, right? Because um, uh, it's it's hard, it's too hard for organizations to let yeah. uh, technical talent grow. Um, the glass ceiling, yeah. Sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah, because sometimes you don't have even that position, right? Um, so I think the the design organization and how we we run it, right? So we don't run it like a like a production machine, right? Putting like lines of designers to create 
you know, screens and prototypes, but actually uh, have different setups for different types of companies, it's something that I think we still don't know. We are in, in a fluid time. I mean, the, the thing that makes these times particularly exciting, as you say, Fabrizio, is uh, we have many competing models. We have many different ways of exploring opportunities, exploring and exploiting opportunities that design brings in. And as teams grow and mature and scale up, this is where uh, I find it exciting to, to see and learn about where design ops is located and it's, it's kind of positioned within the organization. Because what, one of the things that I find sometimes frustrating is the confusion between design program managers and design ops. And when people uh, talk to me and they tell me they do design ops and I start kind of digging a little bit and you find out what they really do and they, oh, I organize meetings and uh, well, I, I do the governance and there's no strategy. So the, the way I tend to kind of start setting uh, some, some boundaries and some lines is if you have a roadmap, a strategy and you spend most of your time thinking about creating efficiencies, improving the ways of working, giving more time to your designers to be more creative and more efficient and bringing more business value, you're doing design ops. If you're executing a project and your goal is the delivery, then you are a design uh, program manager, which both are essential because a perfect execution requires a vision and an execution. And I'm seeing so many organizations, I tend to, to kind of talk to, to a lot of people because I find these times particularly exciting. And uh, we are also exploring, I mean, we have different teams at Intuit in, in design operation and we have slightly different setups. And it's also interesting to see internally those nuances in design operation. So I would lo love to learn from, from both of you or from everyone in, in this call, how is your design operation? Going. Sorry, Bernardo, I'm, I think I'm taking over your role. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Uh, I can just sit back and enjoy, Patricia, please do. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to pick it up from for where you left, uh, or you're, you're teeing, teeing us off. I think um, uh, a big question that I have heard uh, throughout the last few years is from design leaders saying, if I hired a design ops person, what do I do? Um, and I think uh, we have to take a little bit of a step back. We have, as design leaders, and uh, uh, all the people in this uh, forum are, uh, we have been doing design operations just with a different name. We have been working on recruiting, on onboarding, on professional development, on budgets, on uh, design systems, on uh, templating, on standardizing tools, on project plans. Uh, on roadmaps, but if you think about it, if you're doing all these things, at what time do I do the strategic impact? At what time do I develop the relationships with the business partners that I need to develop? The, the only difference between now and our practice maybe five or 10 years ago is that now there's a mindset and a, and a, peop and a people and a role that I can create to help me out, relieve some of the pressure. And uh, by having the uh, design of focus, um, having the design leadership focus on, on the strategic impact, then we have now two, um, a, at least two people, if not two teams, uh, uh, you know, the design leadership team and the design operations team uh, working on amplifying the, the impact and the value of design at a scale. And that is the other aspect that I think is, is super critical in terms of, of both the, uh, the leadership and the operational uh, roles, which is how do we amplify that impact at a scale? And that means not hiring you know, 100 designers, but how can we do more with the 50 or 70 or 20 designers that we have um, in a manner that we can, we can create that impact? And I think... Uh, those are the kind of um, approaches that the organization uh, begins to realize the value of design by uh, how we can scale that, that impact. 
Yeah, I, I think there's there's something very interesting there on the on the leadership part, but also on the kind of organizing the knowledge. Um, I completely agree with you, Jose. I think we've been uh, doing that in organizations. Uh, I've I've been in a large organization before, uh, many years ago, and um, if if you are in a large organization right now, there's there's a lot more literature, right? There's a lot more um, references, right? And I think this is this is super. I mean, this is really important for us as designers and design leaders, right? Because we are we need to evolve the practice. So it's not about us doing things, like each one of us doing our things in our ways in, in different organizations, right? So I think the, just the organization of that knowledge, the, um, the not a standardization, but I think defining archetypes and ways of uh, leading organizations. If you think about it, the, um, it it's always interesting to compare design. Uh, I, I find it interesting to compare design for a lot of different discussions, including leadership, including how designers are understood or not understood in organizations, that kind of stuff. If you compare with different disciplines. So if you compare with someone that's, that's um, you know, been to business school, for example, they've learned about different archetypes of organizations. They learned about how do you measure efficiencies and, and all that. Um, if you go to the technology side, I mean, there's a lot that happened, right? Uh, including um, agile development. Um, so I think, you know, as a field and, and also like as leaders of the field, it's part of our responsibility as well to kind of collaborate and create this frameworks, right? And these ways of understanding how to be, how to do these things. And, and, and I think that goes into another fascinating topic, topic I think for me at right, right now in time, which is design leadership per se. Right, because um, if you don't have those the, that type of support, design leaders feel alone, right? And I and um, I was actually just pulling up. Uh, the, we wrote an article. Some colleagues wrote an article on design leadership, and there's some very interesting uh, data, you know, from this. So I will just talk about it because I think this is a go right into it. Um, so we found out that there's uh, design leadership lacks clarity and ambition. So on the clarity side. Uh, you know, um, fewer than half of the design leaders feel their CEO fully understand their role, right? So, you know, a lot of design leaders are not understood because they also don't have practices, right? And frameworks to, to present and show how they work. You know, only a third of these this, uh, CEOs have, uh, you know, um, trust designers as their direct reports. And the, the ambition side, right? Uh, only one in 10 CEOs says that their senior designer plays a meaningful role in strategy development. So we talk about design strategy and we talk about our role, but also we're not you know, playing a role in design strategy. So I think this is you know, not to, to make it too long of a point, but because um, I think these things are very much connected, right? How do you set up efficient design organizations and how you are actually equipped as a design leader and understood that you have that responsibility, right? In your organizations. And great point. And I think that you are touching on something that it's, it's critical. We always had design leaders that in most cases come from design and have a design mindset. So problem solving, a kind of bro, go broad, expansive way of thinking. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Peter Slope. You get promoted to the level of your maximum incompetence inefficiency or incompetence. So you get promoted because you're good at design, at managing people. Then you are so good to managing small teams that you get a larger team until you don't get to managing an organization. But originally you were very good at design. So what is kind of emerging is the need to combine a business management mindset and an awareness of what is about managing a business. So we are going in circle. Uh, mm -hmm to manage design because the creative aspect <laughs> of it, it's not enough. Otherwise we lose the voice and we go back 10 years ago to be, as uh, Jose was saying, production agency, not a thinking, not a brain, just a hand. Mm -hmm. Wow, maybe we should have a, a course or a coaching for design <laughs> leaders, huh? I feel like there's a huge gap in the market there. There's no university, there's no private course. All you see is courses for junior or mid-level 
professionals. Maybe we should think about creating our own design leaders university. Huh? Who knows? Could be interesting. And well, taking a leap from that booklet, uh, my next question would be in terms of, and some of it we already touched upon here in, in this discussion, but I would love to hear uh, from you what is what are the main challenges for design leaders today from your point of view? Of course, we have mentioned uh, growing in their career, facing a CEO or a board, talking business. I guess these are some of the, the great challenges that they face, recruitment, retainment, uh, organization. Um, apart from the challenges, I guess, if you could share uh, what techniques, solutions, strategies, or sources of content you could recommend for the aspiring design leaders here uh, that they, where they can consume this or what kind of solutions have you found so far to overcome such overwhelming challenges? Hard question, I know. I'm going to, um, I'm going to start with um, a two challenges. I think um, talent um, is, is one of the challenges, uh, in particular in the major cities around the world. Um, I know this goes to the heart of what um, you do at the bridge, um, but um, uh, when you think about it, there's, I don't know, 300,000 designers around the world. And there's, they're concentrated in maybe five or 10 locations around the world. So that means about 10% or 20% of that is left for, for the rest. Um, so I think uh, we have to get more open-minded about the type of people that we uh, bring to the organizations, the type of background, the type of experiences that we um, invite. Not all of them are going to have master's degrees or um, formal education. A lot of them are going to be career switchers. Many of them need the opportunity to create uh, you know, junior designers and, and then evolve into senior people. And I think that is something that uh, historically many uh, design organizations have resisted uh, to being open about that diverse uh, a talent perspective. And then from the business side, I think um, uh, as design leaders, uh, we have to build the relationships with, uh, with, the, with the partners that we have in the organization. And many times is helping them solve a business problem that they think or they didn't know that a design leader can help them with. Um, and we might be doing a design thinking session for them to define the business strategy of their organization, but we don't call it a design thinking session or a design thinking workshop. We call it a business strategy definition session, but we're leveraging the exact same techniques that we're doing with a, a design problem, a product problem or a operations problem. Um, and only through uh, those kind of relationships and those kind of um, uh, situations that we enable the growth of the design value perception in the organization. But we have to invest in developing those um, relationships and having those conversations with leaders. I was reading um, uh, the book by, by Mike Montero, um, Designers uh, Are Ruined by Design. And he has a quote in there like, it's time for designers to take their expensive headphones off, stand in the middle of the room and start driving the conversation. And I think that is it's a call to action, not only to the designs at the production level, but also the designers at the leadership level. Get out there and have those conversations with, with, the, uh, with the partners that you have in the organization. Yeah. The, the, I mean, this is a heated topic. Um, the, so a couple of things that, that come to mind. Um, 
you know, when I think about it, and this is completely empirical, um, you know, there's, I, I recommend, you know, reading through this, uh, this study. Um, if you go to the, to the McKinsey website, you can find it. I mean, it's, it's open out, out there. But I think some, some like particular things, right? Um, we'll start with the, the most, one of the most polemic ones, like the word design, right, in organizations. Um, if the word design uh, is a problem for the organization, just don't use it. Right, just call it something else, you know. Um, call it, um, you know, for not forever, right? But um, but just to to avoid people from bringing their preconceived ideas of what design is, right? Um, and uh, being able to connect with them, like we're uh, we are a tough bunch, uh, you know, designers. Uh, we can uh, not be humble a lot of times. Uh, we have very strong ideas about things. Um, so, and understanding how do you um, create the space for design to grow in organizations, sometimes you have to take, take the time, you know, uh, and set up in waves and phases. And maybe it, it involves in the very, in the very beginning, uh, not using the word design because it will bring preconceived ideas. The, um, the other thing uh, that was, you know, we need to open our heads as well to uh, the fact that there's a bunch of other disciplines and a bunch of knowledgeable people that we can collaborate with. And a lot of the power of the work that we do is through mm -hmm. other people, right? There's no uh, digital product design if there's no developers, if there's no data scientists. Um, so, so the ability of uh, connecting with those and, and fully collaborating, right? And, and, and um, you know, we all tend to think that, um, you know, maybe uh, we're doing the most special thing and, and you know, we're, we're translating the customer. Um, so I think just the ability of, you know, finding that collaboration, I think it's um, also understanding leadership, right? Leaders, there's different types of leadership. Uh, and understand there's, uh, you start with uh, leading yourself, then you lead a small group of people, then you lead a larger group of people, then you lead the business, and then you need to think about the business and the people. Um, and eventually, um, you know, and not eventually, but like all throughout this, your umbrella grows larger. But also the, the, the fact that leadership is not about you. Like uh, we, we, we uh, it, it's, about, it's about other people, right? The, the people that we're working with, the team, uh, and we grow with, um, you know, our opinion, with what we think, um, and uh, just, just the ability. And I see that in, in uh, technical roles. I mean, the benefit of working um, in, with different disciplines is that you can see the differences, but also the similarities. And, and technical roles, a lot of time, uh, it's all about your knowledge, right? Uh, and eventually when you're, what Patricia was saying before, when you're caught in your position of leadership, then it's not about your knowledge anymore, it's about the knowledge of other people, right? And having their space. So, um, and maybe the last point that I can mention, these are all empirical and practical things, is uh, being a product or service leaders, not necessarily just design leaders. Um, because that forces us to think beyond the, to think the product or the service beyond the design of it, but also of how it's going to be the call center, how it's going to be the, you know, the, um, the services that you're going to serve through that. So I think that just opening the, the scope of our thinking is also helpful. That is a really great point, Fabrizio. I was watching the web summit today and there was an amazing talk by Jane Pointer from Space Perspective. They are basically like uh, Virgin Galactic. So what they do is they take you in a balloon up into the space and it's basically space travel. And they hired this agency called Two Things, uh, a design agency. And their brief is to basically design the space shuttle and the whole experience of going up into space. So that involves interior design, engineering, and even the food menu. So they have to design absolutely everything about this experience. And they actually mentioned the concept really close to what you've just mentioned, which is radical collaboration. They said that the only way that they would be able to deliver this experience would be uh, as a radical collaboration of the company with the design agency, right? And they said that actually the deliverable is to design an epiphany because when you go up into space, 
you will have an epiphany, right? When you buy this service, you actually buy an epiphany because you will see the earth from space. Isn't that great? That would be quite a good job, right? To design an epiphany. Never seen that before. But yes, radical <laughs> collaboration, absolutely. is the only way that we can work close with the clients, with the engineers, with the designers, and with the rest of the team in order to achieve amazing results, isn't it? Right, so we have 10 minutes to go. I would like to open for questions. We have some uh, cool questions coming up here in the chat. So I'm going to scroll up and some suggestions as well. So thanks for that. Um, so first question from Emiliano uh, to Patricia and Jose. Where is the design area located in the company? What is the size of the budget for development of designers and the scale of design ops, multiple brands, platforms, and languages? So I guess uh, he's trying to find out a little bit about uh, the size of your team, how you structure it, and, and et cetera. If you care to share short answers, please, so we can try to get to as many as possible. Thank you. Okay. Uh I, I will be very fast. So if, uh, if I look at the international teams, we are now two. Uh, me and someone in Australia uh, and growing, uh, overlooking 60 designers in seven regions. So uh, it's uh, a lot about change management, being creative, co-creating initiatives, influencing. So I can't give you a number for budget, but I could tell you how you can do amazing training for zero cost. I have a program now running for 50 hours, eight months, five hours a week, every week for zero. But that's a long conversation. Awesome. Nice. We yes. like free. About the, the location of um, uh, designing the organization, what I look for is that they are of equal level and footing as product and technology. Uh, when design is a subordinate of either product or technology, uh, their influence changes. And about the size of uh, the design team, I think it really depends. Um, I'm just going to give you the, the current uh, statistics for us in, um, in, my, in my role. My team is now four people. Uh, next year, we're going to double, so we're going to be uh, eight to ten. And I still think we're shorthanded because the, the team is 150 right now and uh, the, it's going to grow to 180. Um, ideal ratio would be um, ideal one to 10. So one design ops person per every 10 designers. And I've seen organizations that are one to five, um, but the majority are one to 20, one to 30, and sometimes even one to 60, which is quite crazy, <laughs> just like Patricia just mentioned. Right. So, Jose, uh, just to get to to understand, okay, uh, it's, yeah, you guys are aligned to technology and business, of course, this is usually the talk, but like, are you under what? Are you under technology? Who's your, who's your boss? Uh, I, no, I mean, I, I, I fall under the global head of, uh, of design for the organization, and she is um, a under the co-heads of digital platform services. So we are under digital. Uh, and, the, and the digital platform services uh, uh, heads uh, report to the uh, global head of uh, corporate investment bank. So we're basically, uh, in terms of her hierarchy, uh, we are two levels down from uh, the operating committee, which is basically the, the governance body of the bank. Uh, so we are at a, as, as almost as high uh, at the executive level as you can see a design organization falling under. So and you're so, like three levels down the CEO or four now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Same and how us. about you, Patrizia? These two, four levels, right. Same for us. Okay. Uh, what, uh, yeah, um, kind of. Uh -huh. yes the same under design. However, one trend that I've started noticing is the creation of a thing that in some organization it's happening, it's called digital ops. So it's not under design, it has design ops, but it's bringing together what was called MarTech. So marketing ops, design ops, uh, content ops, research ops under this digital ops, which is wow. now independent. 
I mean, as I said, it's it's an extremely fluid moment. Uh, experiment. And Patricia, no, I got it. But like when you said, uh, you you guys have no budget for training, so you don't really manage a full budget to to scale through your organization. You have no nope. something as else. So what we have is, yes, I mean, uh, Intuit has $2,500 uh, training budget for every full-time employee. But if you want to make sure that the teams grows at scale and in an organic way, so that everyone is exposed, we have uh, to the same uh, knowledge and input and invest the same amount of time because you will have someone using $2,500 for uh, 90 hours training and someone for a conference. Very different. And also what they learn is very different. So what we created is an experiment this year. Uh, the focus is analytics. It's uh, artificial intelligence and machine learnings applied to design and how to turn observation into insight, which were pains for our teams. And this program had the commitment of all the design leaders in all the seven markets that actually gave up five hours a month to ensure that everyone attends the same lectures and the same initiatives. So I will be tracking all the KPIs, et cetera. So that it's, it's two things. One thing is if you want to grow the team, and I believe that design ops uh, unit of work is the team and not the individual. And another thing is the budget you give the individual to develop as a professional and individual. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. And, and Thank you, you guys. Let me move on to the next question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <We can laughs> Thanks. Fine, Adriano. So the next question I have is, uh, before you go, Fabrizio, I know you have a hard stop. Can you share what McKinsey uh, report you mentioned earlier? I was asked here which one. What was the, the report? Called, uh, the one yeah. called, are you asking enough from your design leaders? Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, next one is, have you measured the financial impact of a design project? Tell us an example and the main learnings you had in the process. Have we managed to do that yet, guys? Or is that still yeah. work in I'm progress? Going to, I'm going to give you a quick one. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a consulting practice, not McKinsey, which was before my, 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 my time in McKinsey. And um, we were doing a, an insurance um, call center and um, the, the team uh, played a five minute uh, call of uh, a reel of, of customers calling the, the customer service center. And it was a subset of a more than 20 minute uh, average call and the executives listening to this uh, uh, call were, were cringing in the desk, almost like, oh my goodness, in, in pain listening to this thing. And basically we made the business uh, case for the um, redesign of this very important uh, frontline uh, service. And it translated to basically uh, more than $2 million savings in the uh, customer service uh, time. And the, probably the most important impact rather than just the cost savings internally was the relief of the pain on the customer when they had a, an incident, they needed help and they have to spend so much time on the phone with the customer service representative. So I think uh, the business impact was twofold, the internal impact and the external impact, um, just as a, as a quick example. Yeah, Great, just, thank to, you, just Jose. to share something, mm -hmm. I need to drop the apologies for that. Um, I, I mean, being, a, being McKinsey, we measure everything that we do, obviously, in every engagement and every client. And, um, and, and the way that we, we tend to think about it is that we don't measure design per se, but we measure the outcome of that collaborative work of designers and developers and, um, and data scientists, for example, within, um, you know, a specific scope of engagement or a product or a service to be launched or something like this. And uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, uh, this collaboration with designers having an important role, you know, the, there was a, one client that we took from zero to 60% um, of all their um, credit card sales online. Uh, so they didn't have any at all. 
so six percent of the revenues of new credit cards offering online it's uh, you know it's it comes out of this uh, and in another case uh, we projected through um, doing uh, the work between design and uh, advanced analytics uh, growth in um, 50 million uh, in LTV uh, of the different of the specific user uh, profiles that were meant to grow in that in that situation so I mean we need to we need to uh, be versed on the language of the business and potentially measure the work of these collaborative teams. I have to go. Great. Apologies for that. Thank you very Rosa. much, Fabricio. And and this is a wrap. Thank you so much to all our speakers today. Thank you to the leaders participating in this edition of the DLC. I've been getting your feedback here. More questions as well. Feel free to send them to me later. We'll try to get back to you. This session was recorded, so also will be available to all members. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm truly inspired. I wish there was uh, an hour more of this. Uh, however, these guys are so expensive. <laughs> but hey, they shared their time for free with us today. So we really appreciate that. And uh, we hope everyone is well. Please take care of yourselves. Take care of your team. Don't forget to ask your team how they're doing today. And have a good one. We'll see you next month. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.